In this edition of Garden Talk with the Tulsa Master Gardeners, we continue our series on insects in the garden by talking about true bugs, such as squash bugs and leaf-footed bugs. Our plant this time is Agastache, which is a great flower for pollinators. We'll give you some suggestions on when to fertilize your turf and how much fertilizer to use, and answer your questions on pruning roses and how to get rid of those moths you sometimes find in your pantry. Welcome to Garden Talk. Welcome back to this week's edition of Garden Talk with the Tulsa Master Gardeners. I'm Tom Ingram. We're here with Brian Jarvis. Howdy, howdy. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I haven't seen you in a while. It's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. Not that long. We Not too far, no. Anyway, uh, this week we're going to continue on with our uh, series on uh, insects. Last week we did aphids. Yep. Talked about aphids. Yep. This week we're going to talk about bugs. Now we tend to call all insects bugs. They're not all bugs. If you're an entomologist, you're, the hair on the back of your neck kind of raises up. up and they, everything's a bug. Yeah. We're going to talk about true bugs. True there's bugs, a, yeah. There's a reason they're called true bugs and we'll get into that. And then some other topics and hopefully have a good... Yeah, fun fun, fun today. topics today. I mean, insects are always always fun for me and, you know, the aphid one was pretty popular last, last podcast and, you know, they're pretty common out in the garden. Right. Um, but we also have a lot of True bugs, true out, bugs out there that that we're going to be be visiting on, and you know they're 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 a pretty good pest, pretty hard to control pest. Right. So our our pest of the week is is true bugs. Yep. And we're, of course, there's eighty thousand different <laughs> varieties of bugs. We're not going to talk about all of those. We're going to kind of talk about the primary ones. Mainly, one of the primary ones we talk about is squash bugs. Squash bugs. I was going to say stink bugs, stink but that's bugs. again similar similar family. But stink but, bug, squash bug, leaf footed bug. Those are probably the big three. We big have ones in, that, in, the that garden. in our vegetable June garden. bugs, but they don't necessarily. They're not even a bug, Tom. There you go. There see? you go. There <laughs> you go. But no, I mean that's kind of what we're going to explain. I mean squash bugs. Squash bugs we hear all the time. How do we kill them? How do we kill them? And man, it's if you've, hard. If you've ever grown squash, you've battled squash bugs or the squash vine borer, which will be another one. Yeah, but, uh, it's a guarantee. So getting kind of scientific nerdy here. So um, go for it. The the, the true bugs are, are a complete. No, they're not a complete. They're incomplete metamorphosis. So we have an egg. We have a nymph. Which, which is a smaller is a version. a smaller version. And I see like the eggs. That, see so like that's the eggs, eggs on the screen. And we'll switch this squash bug here. You see the different sizes. Those are different stages, stages of life. Stages of life. So that's a nymph on the small side. So right. a lot of times, you know, we get a lot of calls. They'll be different colors depending on what, what kind of right. true bug they are. But this squash bug is, is kind of a grayish color. Um, so really kind of looks like an aphid. Kind of has that same body it's shape, like but a, but it's a little bigger. It's not. It's right. it's quite a bit bigger actually than an aphid, but you know, and it and it, and it gradually gets big back to um, to uh, the adult. The adult. Well, again, it goes through. It, basically, they call it incomplete metamorphosis because it's an egg and it's hatched, and when it hatches, it looks like the adult, Similar only the smaller. Adult. It doesn't go through these different different stages. They grow, lose the skin, grow, lose the skin, grow, lose skin, and it totally turns into the full fledged adult. To the full fledged adult, yeah. So, you know, I think when you're scouting, when you're looking at these, you know, like we saw, go back if you would, Tom, those eggs. These eggs are going to be on the underside of the leaf a lot of the time. Which makes them easy to find. Yeah, so you'll lift them up and see them in a row. Uh, they're, they're bronze. Usually they're going to be, you know, most of the times the squash bug, the squash bugs will be a bronze color. But there's other true bugs that'll, that'll look similar. Right. And there's other eggs out there from other insects also. But they'll usually be in a mass. They'll be in a, usually in a row or, you know, not necessarily a pile, but in a row. And so once you turn those over and see them, you know you've got some adults somewhere uh, in, in your garden or on your plant. And if you see this, snip up that, that leaf yeah, and throw it away. Throw it away. You've just uh, solved part of your Slow, problem right Slowed there. them down Interrupted a lot. The life so, so those are the eggs. And then, you know, back to the nymphs. Um, mm -hmm. You know, looking at those, again, on that, on that true bug, you'll see some crossed wings so that the back wing makes an x so if you think of a flat if you think of a flat squash bug or a stink bug right. they they will they will have that cross on that that wing will cross over on their back side right. um, so that's that's kind of the first thing that that comes to mind when trying to identify what they are the next one they have piercing sucking mouth parts like our buddies aphids right. they will pierce in and suck juices Right. Um, so that that is another. That's their. That's the way they feed. Piercing, sucking. It's like you you may not see the bugs, but you may see your leaves kind of starting to get these yellow splotches and turning yellow. 
they're sucking the life they're, out of they them. Are. Essentially. They are. They are. And, and, you know, if, if you let these go, you let those eggs hatch, right. you let those, let those nymphs hatch, before long, you've got an exploded population. Right. And you talk about a hard insect to control. Adult true bugs are almost impossible to control with a with a traditional insecticide. Well, they're kind of armored. They are. They've got that exoskeleton that helps protect them, um, but it also protects them from that chemical penetrating into right. their into their body. Right. Very very difficult to control if we ha if we wait until they're adults. Now these these younger nymphs, they're pretty easy. Uh, they're soft bodied. Uh, the trick on them is that they're going to be hidden. They're going to be under the leaves. Mm -hmm. They're going to be under debris. If you mulch in your garden, they're going to be in that mulch. So we've got to be careful. You know, when, when we start noticing them, we've got to spray or control everything that we, you know, that, that they will be hiding around in and around. Well, and this is the, a good lesson for a good garden hygiene because these guys tend to overwinter and plant debris in your garden. They do. Right? You know, pumpkins are one they love, and I just left my pumpkins free, freeze over, you know, over the winter, and they just sit there, and I didn't till it in. So when I was tilling my garden a month ago, I, you know, I was pulling those pumpkin vines back, and I had thousands of these things. And it's like, oh man, I'm a master gardener. I left these out <laughs> all winter. So, you know, I, at that point, I didn't spray. I just kind of tilled them in, and they're going to be around, so I know they're going to be there, so I've got to be careful. Right. But hygiene, like you were saying, if I would have pulled those leaves, you know, those vines up at the, in the winter and composted them, that would have gave them, gave them less places to go hide and overwinter. Right. So now, I'm, you know, their neighbors or, you know, in a forest or all that, that's where they're going to stay, overwinter in that debris. But uh, it's almost impossible to clear all that out. But if you can take away the majority of them, like, like my pumpkin vines, um, you, will, you will tend to have less, at least earlier on. So they've, they've overwintered in that debris. And then come late April, early May, maybe earlier this year because we've been warmer yeah, this year. Yeah, they're yeah. going to start coming out, yeah. looking for a mate, yeah. laying eggs. Laying that egg and starting that process. Starting so all that over. eggs and then it'll hatch to a nymph and then that nymph will grow, feed, and then eventually get into that adult. Won't take too long. In, in yeah, well, it's cases. like three or four generations a year, Yeah, these yeah. guys. So you can see how if you, if you don't do a good job of controlling them, Give you a few months, and you could yeah. have yeah. a huge have a problem. And and I can one thing we almost guarantee you are going to have squash bugs if you have squash. Yes. So no matter how good your hygiene is, no matter what, you you will more than likely have. Well, they will find yeah. your squash plant. Yeah, I can attest to that. And cucurbits, mostly you know squash, cucumbers, pumpkins, any of those cucurbit crops, uh, they they do tend to like. It. Right. Yeah. yeah. So how do we control these guys? Bricks. <coughs> Smash bricks. Them. Well, you can bricks. I mean, there's always the within the adults. I mean, a lot of people don't like to do this, but you put your gloves on and and, and pick them. Maybe picking. pick them and smash them, or yep. put them in a bag and smash them. I mean, yep. that's the old school way of doing it. Hand pick them off of there. You want <laughs> low maintenance. I mean, low pesticide usage. Pick and them it's off. probably the best, honestly, if you've got four or five plants where you're not out there all day, gum day picking. But you know, if you've got three or four plants, go out and pull them. I mean, it, it, that's probably going to be your easiest. And in that meantime, you'll see the eggs. You'll be able to scrape those eggs or smash those eggs, right. um, and the nymphs. I mean, all of the above. I mean, that's probably going to be your best way because that will control them. You're not going to be able to find them all, but that'll slow them down real good. And that sounds crazy, but you know, spend you know a few few moments a week. Pulling those off, Just looking and seeing, doing yeah. some prevention. But yeah, you can also sure. use some of the more uh, standard things: uh, horticultural oil, mm -hmm. like a neem oil, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. something will work. And uh, pyrethrin, yeah, will yeah. work. Pyrethrin does a pretty good job. But th but then, with the young ones, get them when they're young. Get them young, get them early, because I mean, again, like I've said over and over, if you wait until if you wait until you know they get to that adult, that exoskeleton is very right. thick, very hard. And it, it, you won't be able to control them at all. They get old and cranky and don't like to do what That's you want right. them to do. And we don't like <laughs> to use a lot of those harder insecticides out there because... It's our food. If we do that... You know we're killing a lot of beneficials too, uh, yeah, so that's you know we got to kind of be cognizant and aware of that. So uh, just be be aware, uh, keep you do a good job scouting, and then get them early. And then because if you wait too long, it's it could be a it could be a, a challenge for you. Another thing that that I've heard done is you put a board in your garden. You know a, a piece of plywood or a two by twelve or something where you lay that board down, or a piece of cardboard for that matter and what they're doing they're going to crawl underneath that protected area 
then so after a few days you can lift that up and there'll be there'll be some underneath there and then you can simply smash them or spray them or right. you know drown them or whatever but that's another way to get them uh, put that board down they will crawl under that board so they're not fatal but again Tr true bugs true bugs. Um, true bugs are good that's a good family of bugs that we have quite a few pests uh, in our garden in that right. family so be aware um, do what we've done and I, I think live with them You'll, you're gonna right. have them so right. just be, be aware all right we'll move on to our plant of the week this week plant of the week another great pollinator plant we uh, we call it agastache yep yep and yep. It, uh, I think last week we had Joe pie weed and they talked about the good bang for the buck because it gets so big this is another one buy a plant this thing over like two to four feet tall three feet wide lots of blooms like this all over it they in these kind of cones so they you know spread pop out gradually and then different things you got deadheading will kind of help prolong well, it'll help bloom a little bit the, more the, yep the, the blooming but full sun to part shade obviously more sun more blooms yep. as, as a rule colors what kind of colors have you ran across i mean pinks and yellows pinks, and yellows and, yeah that's yeah. kind of what i've seen too there again good good bang for your buck that plant's going to get pretty good size uh pretty showy flowers and, and again deadheading you don't have to deadhead it but if you do it'll it'll look it'll flower quicker um right. and usually will flower most of the season and it's a perennial that's even better. for my money i want to buy something that's going to be com coming back not just go away each year but everybody's got different Different in their garden. Yeah, full sun. Um, right. It'll it'll handle some shade, but again, it, uh, like most plants, if you know if if we've got it in full sun, it'll flower the most at at its best. And again, these will be covered with bees and butterflies. And yep. those yeah, yeah. They'll be they'll be fluttering all around it. Yeah. What you yep. need for your squash plants to pollinate, to pollinate the squash. To pollinate plant. the squash. That's so right. It's funny how it works that way. That's right. But no, that's a good that's a good plant, Tom. I guess. And again, we have this in our online plant sale. If you'd like to get some of these, tell semestergardeners.org. Click on plant sale and uh, we got them. But you better hurry, the deadline's coming up quick. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right, Agastache. So now's the time, now's the time fertilizing turf, our turf, but turf. not all the turf, no, right? That's not correct. So, some turf. So now's a great time to start fertilizing our fescue. Right. Fescue's kind of went through the season. It's just kind of sit there and uh, it's just waiting on these warm days. And you've, you've probably had to mow it by now. Uh, it's getting to that point. So basically we need to fertilize fescue when we're mowing it, when we're actively mowing it. We're not going to fertilize it in the summer. We're going to hit a little bit in the fall and then a little bit in the spring and then, then enjoy it throughout the, throughout the summer uh, without fertilizing. But now's the perfect time to go ahead and throw a shot of fertilizer on that. Um, pretty simple. I mean, you don't need a, a soil test for this. You want a, a, a couple pounds of urea or turf or something like that, you know, turf fertilizer, but just give us some nitrogen and I think you'll, you'll be happy. It'll cause it to start growing and, and look good. So. Well, the general rule is like one pound per thousand square feet. And, That's correct. And typically it, the fertilizer will, uh, denote different spreaders and tell you where to set that's right that's what they're wanting you to that's do. right and i mean it, it's 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 i hate to say it's not rocket science just a little is going to help i mean you don't you right. don't want to over fertilize but uh, about a pound of nitrogen is kind of where we're at on on turf fertilizer and any fertilizer for that matter but that's going to cause our fescue to really pop up and really start growing and really look good fescue's looking the best it's going to look right now through probably may is when right. it was when we're going to enjoy the best the best look out of it but now is not the time to be fertilizing our Bermuda. Yeah, Bermuda's still trying to get out of dormancy. It's, it's waking up. It's, it's getting there, but it's not quite. The soil temperatures aren't warm enough. I mean, you can fertilize it, but you're not, it's not going to pull it up the most. Another month, we need about middle of April is kind of when we start for our Bermuda grass. Um, we want those soil temperatures to warm up. That way it can utilize it the best. All right. Well, one great resource we have these we call them the green sheets. These are probably like the most given out information sheets that, that we have. That, that, that we have. Yeah. There's one for uh, fescue, cooler season grasses, and then one for Bermuda, and it essentially shows when to seed, uh, when to fertilize, when to pre-emerge. Speaking of pre-emergent, we'll come yep, back to we'll that. Hit. But yep. you know how high to mow. You want to increase the mowing height during the, during the season. But anyway, we'll have a link to these and we'll show them how to get them. But this yeah. is kind of the manual. People those, say, when do I are, fertilize? Like, there it is. There and go. then a good thing on the back side, it, it kind of has chemicals, uh, chemical recommendations. So right. we talked about pre-emergent and then a post-emergent. A pre-emergent quickly is, is a chemical that keeps seeds from germinating. Right. So it's an invisible barrier out there that keeps those weed seeds from germinating. A post-emergent is applied 
after emergent, at post emergent. So, so say we have clover out there now. I noticed some clo quite a bit of clover in some of my fescue and some dandelions. So now's a good time to go ahead and put on a broadleaf weed killer um, to to control some of those broadleaf weeds like the clover, the dandelions, some chickweed, henbit. Henbit, we're seeing those purple flowers out quite a bit now. So we can put that over uh, in our fescue and it won't hurt our fescue, but it'll it'll kill our broadleaf weed. So there's a lot of brands, Scott's, uh, Holtz, lots of different uh, brands out there, but just look for, you know, they're, they're all gonna be similar, but look for a broadleaf weed killer uh, to, right. to control those clovers and dandelions and things. Good right now to do that. Or yeah. if you're like me, just enjoy the flowers. Enjoy the flowers. Keep I like the mowing. yellow flowers and the purple flowers the, from the hymn bit and all, and I just I, I just try to make myself to just get over it. One thing, if I'm OCD, it's, <laughs> it's weeds in my yard. Weeds. I just I, something about it. I just don't like it. Um, I, I I like that pretty golf right. course green, and I don't have it, but it I, that's what I like. So I'll try to kill out my clovers and you know early er, earlier stuff in my fescue right now. So yep, yep. Right. But now now is a good time to start doing that, and then start thinking about. About your Bermuda, but holding off until we until we warm up a little bit more. Right. All right. Question of the week this week. We got a couple of good questions. The first one comes from Angie. She says, "When is the best time to prune prune my roses?" And the question, question. is, right. Right now. Right now. Right now. You know, we we want to hold off as long as we can. And I know, you know, back in February we had you know an inch, two inches of growth already. And then if we pruned earlier back, you know, back in January, February all that new growth is really gonna start shooting out. And that new growth was susceptible to freeze. Right. Well, now we've kind of got out of that deeper freeze in the middle of March onto April. So we've kind of passed that point where we can go ahead and prune, let that rose start growing. Um, and then, then it'll, ha it'll put on some fresh new growth that'll flower. So, um, right. but that, that now's, now's the perfect time to, uh, to, to prune roses. Well, then, then I guess the greater question, you have to back up a little bit. It's like, well, what, can I prune now? Yes, but why do you want to prune? Why are you pruning your roses? Yeah, it's kind of like some people are on their crepe myrtles. It's just a habit. They right. want to go in and chop them down and, and right. every every spring, every winter or whatever. And, and that may be okay, but you don't necessarily need to do that. You may right. be harming that plant by taking off some growth on it. Right. Um, I've got a rose in my area that, yeah, I do take back quite a bit. Uh, I don't need it to get very tall, so I'm controlling that height a little bit. And right. I'll prune it about every two months. Uh, once it gets, you know, waist high, it's kind of hiding the plants in the back. I kind of misplaced it. So I'll keep it chopped off. It'll flush new growth and stay kind of low. So that's one of the reasons I would prune, I will prune my rows. But I've got a couple of them, some, some, you know, some trailers or some bigger roses that I may not touch at all. Right. I may I may come in and clean up, clean the dead out, uh, clean those crossing limbs or the diseased limbs. There's always gonna right. be some of those. Um, I'll go in and prune that out, but I want that height where it'll put on a big show. So I'll leave it, I'll leave it untouched basically. Right, so I mean this thing, the question asks, why am I pruning? Don't just make, don't just prune just because it's a habit. That's right. Well, I always prune. Yeah, well, no. Why? Okay. <laughs> but no, I mean, anyway. you know, check for rose rosette at that point. We all know what kind of what rose rosette is, and you know, we've got it uh, in our in our roses bad. So if, if you start seeing it, um, you can prune some of that damaged out. But more than likely, you're going to have to pull that plant out in the end. It's just you can't outgrow. We can't outgrow the rose rosette. So uh, that, that just, if you see it, you may can prune it out at first and enjoy another month or two, but then plan on getting it out of there if you do have rose rosette. And we'll probably cover that in another episode. We most definitely Much will. More in depth. Most but, definitely but basically uh, on our uh, website, we've got a roses in Oklahoma fact sheet, mm -hmm. which tells you all about roses, how to grow them, what to grow, I mean, take care of them. And then we also have a page on pruning, not just pruning roses, but pruning Darn near every yeah. plant, tree, shrub you can think of, when to prune, how to prune, how much that, to prune. That is, and, and you know, March is a good time to right. do that. I mean, it's, uh, I mentioned crepe myrtles earlier. If you do need to kind of control some height or pull some things out, and you know, March, March is a good time on a lot of perennials. Right. Um, a lot, a lot of saps running at that point, so we can, you know, we can just kind of, it, it's, 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 it's probably your best time to prune, if need be. All right, next question, uh, this is a good one. I've experienced this. <laughs> it says, I have some moths in my pantry. What are they and what can I do about them? This comes from Andy. Well, it's likely this uh, Indian meal moth. 
Yeah, ended meal moth is pretty common. Um, kind of different from what we've been talking about. We're talking about outside stuff. Outside, this is an indoor kind pest. Kind of an indoor pest. Right. But, but in, and, I, and I bet a lot of you have seen these moths flying around and didn't think much of it. And just like you, I kind of had some in, in my pack. I think it was in the uh, cornbread. I had some cornbread that had fall uh, fell out of a box in a back shelf. Cornbread meal? Meal, cornbread meal. Right. And um, so these pantry pests, uh, this particular one is feeding uh, on that meal that is spilt. Um, and then, you know, that's, so then, then we started seeing more and more of those adults. And then before long, I, I realized, well, there's probably some spill. There's probably some sort of grain right. in my pantry that that is where it's harboring these these insects. So. Well, and it, this is like the adult here, but there's also those larvae. If you like, I know I've experienced this. You probably have too. But you keep your flower in your pantry, and then you go get the flower and you open it up, and there's a little little webbing a little there, cobweb, little cobweb on maybe. there. It's like, uh oh, yeah. And then yeah. Uh, you start putting two to get it together, and and the next thing you know, you go like. I have been seeing some little bugs flying around every once in yeah, a while. And it's yeah. likely these uh, Indian Indian meal moths are pretty small, like about a yeah. half inch. Yeah, about probably probably the size of your uh, fingernail, probably fingernail. your pinky fingernail would right. be about the size. But they're they're going to have this band. It's pretty, you know, that you see a dark ba light band across the middle of their body, back. Right. Um, th and then frivoly, frivoly uh, wings at the end. Is that a real uh, word? Yeah, I don't know, but it sounded <laughs> good. But but no, I mean, it, it, this that adult's all going to look like that. Hopefully, you don't see the the larvae, but that's going to be in that box of cereal or right. in you know where that rice is or whatever. Um, but like you said, the cobwebs, um, cobwebby material that they've spun is right. going to be right at that top surface. So. Well, and sometimes I know I even found them like in a box of cereal, the cardboard fold in the bottom, like in in between the cardboard. Yeah, that's in right. There. So that's uh, right. They'll, they'll get in there and they can. They're pretty prolific. The fe each female can lay about four hundred eggs. Yeah, yeah. So you can see how pretty quick it, you could have a it can a, explode a serious problem. It can explode. So the adult the adult's not feeding. <coughs> it's the larvae that's feeding on that grain. Right. And um, so yeah, but the adults are the telltale sign. So they uh, they're like any other moth. They want to go to the light. So you may see them around your light at night or in your kitchen around, you know, underneath the, the uh, oven, you know, the oven light or the stove light. Um, right. Just they'll, they'll, they tend to go to light, so that's where you'll see them. But, you know, if you see uh, quite a few and then they have that, that, that tan band, I guess, more than likely that's what it is. So if you got them, getting rid of them, you got a good hygiene. You got to clean up. Clean up. Maybe you got to throw out some stuff that you didn't want to throw out. Yeah, but we got to clean up and get rid of those things. We all have that box of of you know cornbread or whatever in the back of the pantry that we forget about, and that's right. just a perfect harboring place. It's all protected. Everything's good um, until they until they start showing up. So yeah, you probably do need to clean them up. Usually one cleanup's usually good. Um, you know, if you've got a lot of material out. You know, like that box of cereal or, uh, you know, open flour, it's good to put it in a sealed container. Right. Um, you can put it in a sealed container and you, you, you can, that, that will help keep things out. Another thing that we hadn't thought of is dog food. Right. Dog food may be in the utility room, so you may notice more of them in the utility room. Well, that dog food may have fell down by the baseboards or things and they, they have found it and start feeding on it. So. All kind, they're going to eat that grain. So any anywhere where grain could be corn, um, you know, oats, any any type of grain, that's where that's where they have a chance to be. All right, and a good strategy, and I've had success with this, are those pheromone traps. Yeah, they're little triangle cardboard traps, pheromone traps that attract. Yeah, it em emits a scent, and they're going to track it, but it's, it's lined with sticky. Yep. And they get in there and they get on that sticky and, and fly in there and, and, and fly and, in there and, and they're stuck. And they and you know them that way, and then that at least give you a sign that, that you're see, you, you, they're somewhere, you've got to find their source. Right, yep, yep. and you can just, you know, those traps are good for several weeks, but you can just keep sticking those traps at it until someday there's no, there's no, no insects no, in your around. trap anymore. Yep, so you yep. know, so like, well, we've got rid of them you're, all. Then. You're good to go. You know, and you know, a traditional spray, I mean, you can, you can spray, but a lot of the times you, you're gonna have to sanitize first anyway. Right. So try to clean them up, um, get all that debris out of there, and I, I honestly think you'll be you'll be well off after after that. All right, so that wraps up another episode here. We're glad you were here. We'll see you next time. Sounds good.